So, Foreign Minister of Estonia, Magnus Sagna, thank you very much for coming to this interview. Now, August the 24th is Ukraine National Day, and the country celebrates its independence that it gained uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. But of course, this year, there will be no mass events because of martial law in the country because of Russia's invasion. When do you think will Ukrainians be able to celebrate their National Day again in the streets? I really do hope that already next year. But uh, we have to carefully follow the principle that uh, not to find a peace with any, ca any cost in the meaning of... Uh, we have experienced already this uh, 2014 when actually the Russian aggression started. And then uh, there was a high pressure to find the peace. But actually there was no uh, real results or the finishing the conflict on aggression. So, and it was repeated again with a full-scale war in, in Europe and the genocide and deportation of children. So what is our position together with the Ukrainians to follow the President Zelensky peace plan with, a, with a 10 different points mm -hmm. and to believe in that and support con continuously Ukraine as long as it takes. But of course we must understand that Ukrainians are fighting not only for their freedom and lives but also for our values. So this is a common understanding happily today. But you haven't given up hope yet that the end of the war might happen over the next couple of months. I don't believe in that, really. I'm realistic. And this is a big mistake that everybody was expecting the counterattack, and now there is one counterattack, and everything will be finished. This is not a war movie, as I said before as well, that uh, people are watching the TV and, and it's already like two and a half hours and we're now uh, waiting for the happy end and the heroes coming uh, and having the final speeches. It's not like this. This is a, this is a huge strategy and, and, and we have to deal with that. We have to finish this war a uh, proper way that everybody understands that now it's finished, the international law is re-established and also the leadership has put under the trial about the aggression crimes. Uh, the reason is that we have to push Russia back to Russia and also take away any kind of understanding for the future to repeat this kind of aggression. And this is, this is sometimes hard to understand because in the war movies it doesn't happen. But uh, this is not a movie, this is a reality and uh, this is not only the problem for Ukrainian nation, this is a problem for all of us and especially for Estonians and Baltics uh, and Poland who are a neighboring country. Yeah, you've already uh, mentioned the word accountability, of course, and ending it also on the legal field. And Estonia has been calling for an international tribunal for Russian crimes um, in Ukraine or against Ukrainians for a long time. It's not new. Where are we standing there? Is there any progress that you're noticing? Of course, there are progresses. Uh, if we talk about the, the crimes against the humanity, uh, the war crimes, uh, they are documented and also there is a warrant actually about uh, the Putin. And that's the reason why he's not mm -hmm. able to, uh, to participate on a different uh, and this kind of uh, big meetings. And this is a good sign. But we are talking about the crimes about aggression, uh, the leadership crimes. And today, if you're following the United Nations Security Council, where the aggression is part, so they can better all the different decisions. So we have to find the, the path or the way of international public law that we can put the, the leadership under the trial about the aggression crimes. Because uh, I think that uh, the people who are watching TV or, or following the news, they cannot understand that how Putin is not responsible for the aggression crimes. But actually international law at the moment is, is based on these kind of cases. But we believe that we can change it if we have uh, enough the political will. And, and there is a way, and this is a long-term uh, discussion, and we are really pushing it hard, because this is an existential question for, for all different nations, and for Estonian as well. And in the meantime, another discussion that is going on is, of course, about security guarantees for Ukraine. Estonia, again, one of the strongest supporters of Ukraine, has said that Ukraine has to have solid security guarantees also by NATO. NATO says Ukraine will become a member once the war is over. So what happens in the meantime? Shouldn't the Allies give Ukraine some sort of a security guarantee-like measure so that they can feel safe again? We have to name things in correct ways. If we talk about security guarantees, and security guarantees uh, supported by the military power, it can be only the full membership of NATO, based on the Article 5 rule about one for all, all for one. 
And this is not only one way to get in the meaning that uh, if uh, Ukraine will be uh, attacked again, that we all go into the war uh, to protect them. But the other way around, actually, in our region, after the war, when Ukraine will become the full member of uh, NATO, they are the one of the biggest military power and the only country who has really experienced the war against Russia using NATO weapons. So they can be a guarantee in our region as well, uh, in, in military ways, in the Zawalki cap and, and the politics of the Poland. So this is a long-term uh, understanding that there won't exist any more like grey zones of neutrality. Even the, the people of Sweden understood it after like 300 years of neutrality. They decided to join NATO and I really do hope that they will finally become full member. And uh, this understanding is there. This, these kind of securities, they must uh, be a part of the new architecture of our, our security in, in, in Europe as well. The real guarantees. But Estonia joined uh, the G7 declaration last week. And uh, this is a big, big thing in a good ways. Uh, they are much more like assurances for long term. Long term commitments on the military ways and, and also the, the budget support and the political support and also uh, recovery of Ukraine. And uh, this is like the frame, it's not just a declaration. We uh, coordinate the, the long-term support uh, between each other in the frame of the G7 uh, declaration of supporting Ukraine. And uh, this is very important for Ukrainians as well, that they know this is not like the project-based support, as it has been, because we are always waiting the, the, the final uh, counter-attack. And uh, these two things, they're working together. Also, the, the, we must start negotiation process, official negotiation process, uh, uh, Ukrainian joining the uh, European Union. All these three things together, they are the, the security assurances on different uh, levels. So do I understand you correctly that you're not in favour of a Germany-like solution? You're here in Berlin at the moment, the capital of what was once a divided country, where only the West was a member of NATO and the Communist East wasn't. And people are talking about the possibility of making that something workable for Ukraine, potentially. Is that something that you see? Western Ukraine, member of NATO, Eastern Ukraine, not? Territorial integrity is one uh, principal uh, value for Estonia uh, through the history. We have been occupied and, uh, and we are very grateful for the countries who have never recognized this occupation as the US uh, did all the years. So uh, making any kind of deals uh, under the Ukrainians or with their territory or integrity, this is a big mistake uh, for the future. So we have to rely on the Ukrainians' will and also understand that this is not just to finish the war, to find the peace. We have to finish the war in a proper way that Russia or whoever leadership will never do it again. So uh, it needs time, but also it needs like the continuously understandable uh, international public law actions. So this kind of deal that let's, let's uh, I don't know, share the Ukraine somehow, or let's divide it, uh, let's find a peace. This is, this is not, I think, uh, something that Ukrainian people can understand at all. I'm the father of the four children, and Estonia is putting 3.2% of GDP to defense. I would like to put this money to their education or, or, or the social benefits and whatever, but I understand that now we must uh, pay for that. We have increased taxes in Estonia just a couple of months ago because of that, and people are supporting it. But we have to deal and get rid of the real problem, not just to hide it somewhere, as we have done during the last couple of years, a couple of decades even. I would like to come back to that point that you mentioned that we have to rely on Ukrainians that they know best what's best for their country. Now, in the press conference with Annalena Baerbock, the German foreign minister, um, when you were asked about the increased presence of Ukrainian drones in, on Russian territory, you said that Ukraine does have the right to defend itself. Now, I would like to ask you, how far can Ukraine go in terms of choice, how to defend itself, even on Russian territory? Putin and Russia started this aggression, and not only like military conflict uh, based on uh, in the international law, so-called, if you can ever aggression uh, uh, if, if aggression can ever some kind of uh, having uh, some moral ground, but there is a genocide, there is deportation of children. This is a full scale of uh, awful, awful uh, actions in the 30, 21st century in Europe. So Ukraine has all rights to defend 
uh, himself also using uh, attacks in Russian territory. So we have to support it and understand it because they fight for their lives. And the other thing what we must understand uh, from the uh, late history is that maybe we were not sure all the time when Ukraine have had different, uh, has had different like revolutions or whatever, where the leadership of Ukraine will, will, will go, whether it's uh, Moscow or, or Western mm. side. Now it's clear for the next uh, generations, I think, that uh, Ukrainians are not going back to, uh, to work together with Russians, but they belong to us. And, and this is our opportunity as well to welcome them. They're part of our values. And this is a very, very big thing. And you said it again, Ukraine has the right to defend itself, yes. and you say even on Russian territory. But the question is still, um, there is a discussion about whether we, the West or the Ukraine's allies should um, send essentially cruise missiles to Ukraine. And some people are saying they are afraid that those cruise missiles might then end up on Russian territory. So I would like to ask you about that question, because there is a very strong debate. Should Germany send Taurus cruise missiles to, to Ukraine. How much of a war impact would those weapons have at the moment, do you think? There is a war and the Ukrainians are fighting not only for their own interests, uh, but for all of us. So in the war, if one part is not uh, following any kind of uh, rules, uh, using any kind of, uh, of action plans and, and, and tools, so we have to support Ukraine uh, as much as we can and also as much as they ask, because they are in a war, they are at the battlefield. So, of course, uh, there is always the fear about escalation. But I'm asking what is the escalation, if it is not already escalation? We cannot uh, play the games like this, that Ukrainians are dying and fighting for their freedom and our freedoms as well. But we are just discussing here how can we help them and what is good or what is proper or what is not proper. Of course, we have to follow the human rights and, and the war crimes and all the international law things. But uh, finally, uh, we have to finish this war and we have to support Ukraine to win the war. And the war is awful thing, of course. If some uh, people in Russia will die, I don't know, is it good or bad? Of course, bad thing, but uh, Ukraine, they didn't start this uh, aggression. So this is awful thing, but this is war. As I mentioned before as well, not the movie. This is real thing. So uh, if we support as much as we can, and the Ukrainians ask, uh, the earlier uh, this conflict will be finished in the military ways. Is this a recommendation for the German government? I cannot recommend uh, to the German government. I'm, I, and I always uh, say as well that uh, uh, somehow uh, there is a lots of criticism about the German government. But actually, if you think about the, the German uh, history and the past, and also the big decisions that the, the German nation has made now uh, to support military, the third country out from the European Union, these are the big, uh, big decisions for the nation uh, based on the historical background. And, uh, and I think that uh, there, there is, we have to give more time for these kind of debates. Uh, and uh, if German government has decided something, then uh, I have been always sure that it will happen. Worst case scenario is, is some, maybe some other uh, leaders can just promising that of course we do, we send, we do things, but actually nothing happens. So let's be patient and give the time and, and also explain why uh, these kind of decisions are needed. So I'm the foreign minister of Estonia, so we have given everything what we have. Uh, more than 1.3% of our GDP and the most of our uh, ammunition and everything because we know that otherwise we must use them in our territory. Now Ukrainians use them in their territory to fight for us. You've mentioned several times now that this is not a war movie. How worried are you that people are getting tired of the war in Ukraine worldwide as well? This is one mission what we have uh, agreed in Estonia that to explain constantly that not to get tired. It is understandable that the people, they have their own concerns and own, own problem to solve. We, have, we are living in a very difficult times in economical ways. Uh, financial markets are, you know, turbulent. Uh, but uh, we have to understand that uh, we must uh, constantly support Ukraine. And uh, I'm going around the world and explaining as well, not only the war situation at uh, the battlefield, but also about the deportation of children, really. We don't know exactly how many thousands of children are for sale now, 21st century in Europe, and kidnapped. 
uh, these kind of stories, they touch actually all the mothers and fathers globally, in Africa, in, in, in Latin America, everywhere. So we have constantly uh, explain what is really going on. And I think that today's communication gives us this opportunity as well. I think that Ukraine actually won the war already when the Bucha disaster and these awful actions uh, came public, uh, just a short period after the war started. Then it was a turning point. I don't believe that that was some kind of uh, the great minds of the world the leadership actually decided somehow to put more effort into the Ukraine. But actually they were people, individual people, who started to ask from their politicians that how much can we do, how, what can we do more to support that this awful, uh, awful, awful thing will, will be finished. We must constantly talk about these awful things to, to all the people in the world and then the political leadership will follow them. Do you get the feeling that the message is being heard worldwide? There's also fear of destabilization in the entire region as a whole in, in Eastern Europe and that, of course, Russia's war on Ukraine has implications for other countries. Is this message getting heard? You know? I think that more and more, and even what we see as a big institution with a pretty slow uh, decision-making processes as EU has changed, we, we, we were used to discuss about our budget in EU to give more or less to, to farmers. But now EU is supporting militarily the third country. These kind of big changes actually are the reflection as well that uh, there is an understanding uh, beyond the different nations and the people that uh, there is a support for that. So uh, I think that people understand it, especially in, 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 in our region, that, uh, that we must support Ukraine and mainly based on our own security. And of course, uh, we understand how, uh, how, how difficult situation the Ukrainian nation is. But uh, yes, there is an understanding. But of course, if you are living uh, the other side of the world, uh, sometimes it may look like that there's some kind of war in Europe. That's the reason why you have to constantly talk about this awful uh, crimes against humanity, against uh, against uh, people, about, against women and children. This is like unique uh, understanding globally. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of religion you have. This is a common understanding as as, as a human beings. And as Ukraine celebrates its national day, um, you as an Estonian, your country has a lot in common with Ukraine in terms of history. You celebrate uh, your independence, the restoration, also in August, and that also goes back to the year 1991, to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So how do you look at this war personally? You're fairly new to this job as foreign minister. W what is your personal relationship to this war? Uh, as Estonian, the relation is, is very personal and uh, from our families. And, and one thing is that uh, we actually lost our independence and were occupied in uh, 1940. And uh, at this time, uh, we, we, start, we, 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 we tried to find a solution in peaceful way. But actually, we lost one third of our nation or one fourth of, of, uh, of killing or deportations or, or refugees. So what we have learned that we have to fight back as Ukrainians are doing now. And the second thing is that uh, never be alone again. This is a common understanding for, for all Estonians. So we must part, we must be a part of NATO, EU, all, all different democratic world uh, organizations. And we understand the same way we have to fight for Ukraine, that, uh, to, to integrate them in. This is the only way, not to play in the middle of the gray zones are finished. It's, this is not the security for the independence. But also I, I was the defense minister of Estonia and then I know as well a bit about the, the reality, about the capabilities, about the plans, about the, uh, we need boots on the ground. So this is not only the theory and this is not only politics, this is a real capabilities and it needs money, it needs men and it needs as well the planning for the long future. So it has been a big change as well in Europe. Actually, we put more money for our same, our, self, our own protection for the future. So I think that this aggression has uh, opened a big change in the world as well. But I hope that the world will become more secure that is, as it was. One last question on how you define the end of the war. I define uh, the end of the war when uh, Russia has pushed back to its territory. 
when the territorial integrity has re-established, when the international law has uh, re-established in the meaning as well of all the crimes against humanity and the war crimes, but also the, the crimes about leadership. Uh, when uh, we uh, have started to use the frozen assets, actually we have delivered the law draft for that and I hope that the Estonian Parliament will adopt it this autumn as an example for European Union as well, how can we actually use these frozen houses to recover the Ukraine. And I, I really uh, hope that then after the war was finished and already now, even uh, when the war is ongoing, we build up the Ukraine all together. It, it must be a part of our common understanding and also our common uh, economy in the future as it was Marshall Plan after the Second World War. So then I'm satisfied. Thank you very much, Estonian Foreign Minister. Thank you.